Good morning. It's, it's an honor uh, for me to be here. Um, I want to thank my, my colleague and my friend and confidant, Reverend Laura, for inviting me. Um, it's, it's a beautiful thing to have a friend uh, just down the street. Uh, I'm not sure I actually merit this honor. I'm not sure I'm a big enough person to be here. And I'm saying that mostly because my feet don't touch the ground in this chair. <laughs> so, perhaps a sign of something. You'll, you'll decide when I finish this sermon, I suppose. Uh, so most people in business know about something called the 80-20 rule. It's this simple truth that most people in most jobs have to spend 80% of their time doing the things in their job they hate in order to spend 20% of their time getting to do the things about their jobs that they really love. Now, I became a rabbi mostly because I loved being a Jew when I was a teenager. I loved my Jewish summer camp. I loved the Sabbath there. I loved the hippie guitar playing counselors and their music. It was the 70s. I loved the pretty girls from Chicago with flowers in their hair. It was the 70s. I loved the rabbis there who seemed so wise and looked as if they knew a special secret that other people didn't. I loved my youth group at my temple in Minneapolis. I loved my Jewish friends, the dill pickles at my Bubby's house, the smoked whitefish on Sunday mornings my dad got up early to buy from the deli. I wanted to be a rabbi because I loved so many things about being a Jew. And I was sure that when I finished rabbinical school, I would spend my time making our camp as great for our temple's kids as mine was for me. I would study and teach the Talmud. I would write inspiring sermons, read and write wonderful books and ponder the great mystery that is life itself. Day after day, after month, after year, after decade, I would do those beautiful things until I would rest forever with those who came before me cradled like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the arms of God. And that's pretty much the way things have turned out for me in my career choice. About 20% of the time. But 80% of the time, my job goes something like this. Staff meeting with the heads of schools. Staff meeting with the clergy. Staff meeting with the administration and security team. Staff meeting with the development team. Marketing and communications meeting regarding delayed website launches for schools, camps, and temple. Budget meeting. Meeting with the head of HR regarding improper documentation procedures, scholarship procedures, and policies. And a special request from the heads of our schools and security to discuss parking at our campus in West LA. I spent more time this past week discussing parking than I did discussing the Bible, God, and faith. About 80% more time. Number of parking spaces, 62. Number of students in early childhood summer day camp first session, 200. Nursery school day camp drop off time, 9 a.m. Elementary school day camp drop off time, 8.15 a.m. Amount of time to clear lot, insufficient. <laughs> Backup on Barrington to Olympic, wait time seven minutes on average. Number of conditional use permit violations as a result of said backup, two. Likelihood of neighborhood council filing a complaint with the city, extremely high. <laughs> Number of additional spaces needed, 50. Cost of moving all staff not already required to park off-site to additional rented off-site parking, $40,000. 
total estimated summer off-site parking budget, if additional spaces can be found, 75,000. Why can't we just get the people in and out faster? <laughs> I asked the head of our nursery school and the elementary school summer day camps. How long does it take to drop your kid and leave? And that's when she laughed. <laughs> the head of our nursery schools, an amazing early childhood educator, educator, the best I have ever seen. She's friendly and warm with the kids and parents, but she is all business in meetings. She was laughing out loud at my seemingly simple question. It's the separation, she said. Rabbi, it's the first week of camp and it takes time for the new children to separate from their parents. And it takes even more time for the parents to separate from their children. How much time, I ask? Sometimes all morning, she answers. <laughs> we can't get the parents to leave sometimes, and sometimes the kids just can't let go. It'll be better in August, but for now, we can't get the cars out of the lot any faster. Come on, how bad can it be, I challenge. Show up tomorrow at nine in the morning and see for yourself, she answers. So I did. Friday morning, I stood at the gate of the temple's West LA summer camps and watched a parade of anxious parents with three-year-olds wrapped around their legs like Velcro, begging them not to let go. There they were, teary eyes, drippy noses, outstretched pleading arms, the whole bit, and that was just the moms. <laughs> Now some of the kids were crying too. Mommy, please don't leave. I'm too sad inside to say goodbye. Hyperventilating, red-faced, tear-stained, cherubic faces, broken-hearted over having to say goodbye. It's hard to let go. And then I came home to write this sermon for you and what you as a congregation and community are going through. I came home to write this sermon about having to say goodbye to a past leader and an era and an uncertain future. My first thought was of Abraham and when we first meet him in the Bible, the scripture read this morning. God commands Abraham, the first Jew, to leave his country, his home city, his relatives, his parents, his childhood home in pursuit of an unknown land and an unknown religion. He did not ask to be called or to be sent or to wander, but that's what happened when he least expected it. He arrives in Canaan only to be forced out by famine. After fleeing to Egypt to escape that famine years later, Abraham returns to Canaan. Once there, he says goodbye to his nephew Lot and sends him on his way. And then God appears in a vision telling Abraham his descendants will become aliens in a land not their own for 400 years. Finally, Abraham undergoes circumcision at the age of 90 and learns that every eight-day-old Jewish boy will be handed over by his parents and circumcised, acknowledging that that baby belongs not only to his parents, but to a people and to God, and that is sometimes painful. And soon after that, Abraham is asked to sacrifice his own son. Sitting at my desk, thinking back on those crying children at our day camps and Abraham's life some 3,000 years ago, and this holy place, the words come to me with zen-like clarity. All of life is separation. I'm not one to overly idealize separation. It hurts. Anyone who's put a beloved dog down or 
handed a set of car keys to their 16-year-old for the first time knows that even ordinary goodbyes can be so painful. The tears in parents' eyes are always bittersweet at a christening, a bar mitzvah, confirmation, graduation, or wedding. I have officiated at many, many hundreds of weddings, and each time I watch those dads hug their daughters and place them into the arms of another man, and I think of my own daughter, and I just do not know how I will do it. Yes, I want her to live a full, beautiful life. Yes, I want grandchildren. No. I do not want to let her go. And of course, there are more difficult separations too. A funeral for a baby in a coffin the size of a shoebox. The flipping off of your mother's respirator switch in the ICU the hapless Sunday father returning his children to the house he once lived in and the woman he once loved. A son. Leaving his father behind in the nursing home as he gets on a plane to return to Los Angeles so far, far away and wondering if that was the last visit and the last kiss. Playgrounds, airports, dorms, hospitals, front doorsteps, nursing homes, cemeteries, all full of painful goodbyes. But it has always helped me, and I hope that it will help you too, to know that Judaism mandates goodbyes be said with a certain measure of hope. We end our Sabbath each Saturday night at sundown with Havdalah, a beautiful ceremony that means separation. It includes extinguishing a candle in sweet wine and ending with a song asking for a week of peace and a time of redemption for all of humankind. Our Passover seders end with the words, next year in Jerusalem, which is our way of saying we hope for peace in our spiritual homeland. Our Torah, which are the first five books of both the Hebrew and the Christian Bible, our Torah is read from beginning to end in 52 one-week sections each year. And in the fall, when we conclude the reading of our Torah scroll with that very last section, we immediately roll it back to the beginning and start again. Funerals end with a mourning prayer called the Kaddish, a prayer that does not contain a single reference to death. It is entirely about the generous gift of life and God's goodness. At the completion of the seven-day mourning period after one of our loved ones die, which is a time when we stay home and allow the community for care, to care for us, it is customary for me, the rabbi, to conclude that seven days by taking the mourners out of their home for a brief stroll, literally walking them back into life. Now get this, the word goodbye does not even exist in Hebrew. There is no such word. When saying goodbye in Hebrew, we say lehitraot, which means see you again. Somehow, Jews trust that every ending is also a beginning, even a painful ending. Now, since we began with Abraham, let's recall the story of God's decision to destroy the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. God's last instruction to Abraham and his family is to flee those wicked cities before God rains fire down upon them. And then God warns, do not turn around. Do not look back at the destruction. But as they flee, Lot's wife, Abraham's niece, she cannot help herself. 
She turns around to look at the wreckage of where she came from. And then, as the Bible puts it, she turns into a pillar of salt. Now, I have always understood this to mean that if we are too focused on the past, especially the pain of our past, the wreckage and the fire, we will become paralyzed and bitter like a pillar of salt. And if you think deeply, very deeply about our two traditions, you realize that both Judaism and Christianity are fundamentally about the future. Thy kingdom come. Yes, history and ancient texts are important, but what is the real mission, the essence of our mutual enterprise and faith? It is the future. Christians await the second coming, Jews the first. It doesn't matter because in both cases we are working toward, praying for, hoping for, living, and even dying for something beautiful that has yet to happen. Not some momentous event that has already taken place. We both lean forward. Now this is true. But you wouldn't always know it from the way most of us think and act most of the time. And by the way, I think this is particularly true of Jews. 4,000 years of oppression have caused many of us to fear the future and to catastrophize the future. Some of you know I've written a book about pain and what it comes to teach us. Now, in my research for the book, I learned that whether or not a patient catastrophizes the future has a powerful effect on how much pain the patient feels during his or her illness. Nevertheless, so many of us imagine the worst when it comes to how things are going to turn out. We cannot seem to help it. Consider the joke about three very thirsty men. The Scotsman says, I am so thirsty, I must have a scotch. The Italian says, I am so thirsty, I must have a glass of Chianti. And the Jew says, I am so thirsty, I must have diabetes. <laughs> we can't seem to help it, you know. We, we just see the tunnel at the end of every light. I don't know. I, or as I like to put it, a sad Jew is a happy Jew. That's just, uh, that's just who we are. It is not our finest trait. And it is not really how most things work out. Believe me, I am not campaigning for it, nor does the job exist. But if there was such a job as chief rabbi of those who suffer, and I held that job, this is what I would say to the victims of pain. I would remind them that life is long, long enough to start again, to rebuild, to take more pictures, to create more memories, to heal. I would remind them that the day begins at midnight, the darkest hour, because it helps to live with faith that darkness will somehow be followed by light. I would remind them that hope begins when the moon is new in its darkest phase, just a slim crescent of light against the black sky. And I would remind them that faith in that which we cannot see through our tears is the truest faith of all. 
Abraham says a lot of painful goodbyes. But in return for his losses and his faith, God makes Abraham a promise. I will make of you a great nation and you shall be a blessing. You are a great congregation. And you too, despite a painful goodbye, will go forward to become an even greater blessing. I watched all of those parents picking up their kids from day camp yesterday afternoon. The little ones ran into their arms full of finger paint and laughter. The morning's fear and anxiety long behind them, wrapped around their mommies and daddies with all their three-year-old might. They were happy. And mom and dad were proud. It was a simple ordinary moment but in it I saw again the exquisite truth of Abraham's life yours and mine all of life is separation every departure and arrival because blessings do not come any other way. <laughs>